Excellent. I think we're live now. Yeah. Um, hello, everybody. Uh, welcome to uh, slightly later than usual lunchtime live. Um, our uh, latest uh, video hangout. We've not done one of these for a while. So uh, uh, hello if you've never been to one. And if you are coming back again, hello again. Um, I'm here uh, with uh, Emily Coleman, who is our wonderful uh, chief accountant uh, here at Free Agent, um, who's our sort of small business uh, guru and sage. Um, <laughs> and we're here today to talk about uh, self-assessment. Um, it's uh, obviously a you know, big issue at the moment. The deadline is, uh, is, is, is coming quickly. Mm -hmm. So uh, we're going to be looking at uh, self-assessment today and um, taking any questions that, uh, that, that you guys have if you're, if you're watching uh, and running through a, a bit of the process about exactly what self-assessment is, some of the things to watch out for, and uh, what the process is to actually get your self-assessment tax return uh, completed if this is your first or multiple year of, 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 of doing it. Um, as a quick introduction, uh, I'm Adrian. I work in the uh, in the comms team here at Free Agent. Uh, Free Agent, we are a uh, online accounting software for small businesses, contractors, and freelancers, and their accountants. Um, so uh, hopefully, if you come to us, you uh, know everything about us. But if not, uh, do go and uh, visit www.freeagent.com and have a look around and uh, uh, check out uh, what we do, who we are, and whether we could help you. Excellent. Um, well, I think uh, we'll probably best just get to get straight through to it. Um, if you're watching and uh, there's something that you specifically do want to ask us, there is a Q&A tab uh, which you can see on this video. Uh, if you scroll the mouse around somewhere around the, this box, you'll see it. That should open up the, uh, the Q&A tab and then you can just write down anything you want and, uh, and, and we'll answer it. Um, if that doesn't work for you, then just write something through on the page that you came through. Uh, so the page that had the uh, the link to the video on. Uh, I'll be looking down at my laptop here, seeing everything that comes through. So if there's something that you want to, to ask Emily, then uh, do that and we'll uh, get to it as soon as we can. But first things first, I think we're going to cover some of the basics first. So, you know, if, if, uh, you guys coming in and watching may well know this uh, already, especially if this is like the second or third year that you've been doing this. But for anyone that's new, uh, that's going through this for the first time and uh, is maybe a little bit worried about what the what the process is, we'll just uh, uh, cover the basics first. So uh, first question is exactly who has to file self-assessment? Well, basically just about anybody who owns a business. Um, there's quite a lot of other reasons why you might have to file a tax return. For example, if you're a minister of religion or you get income from a trust. But if you are the owner of a small business, whether that's as a sole trader or partner in a partnership, or you're the director and shareholder of a limited company, or even if you're just the director of a limited company without owning shares, you're almost certainly going to have to file a tax return. If you hear, by the way, talked about self-assessment, tax return, self-assessment tax return, filing your tax form, anything like that around this time of the year, it almost certainly means the tax return that has to be filed to HMRC to report an individual's income and any expenses that can be deducted from that income and then whatever tax is due and tax and national insurance in some cases as well which is all worked out using this one form which HMRC call as I say either the tax return income tax return self-assessment tax return or SA100. Excellent and a second question following up from that yeah. uh, how exactly do you do it what's the um, what's the process that you have to go through if you're doing uh, self-assessment for the first time uh, if you're doing self-assessment for the first time, you need to make sure that HMRC, that's HM Revenue and Customs, the tax man, um, are expecting a tax return from you. Because if they're not expecting a tax return from you and you try and file it, they'll reject it. So you need to have registered with HMRC to file tax returns. If you're a sole trader, then you'd register as an individual and you'd let HMRC know that you are in business. You need to do that by the 5th of October following the end of the tax year when you started your business. And the tax year, by the way, runs from the 6th of April one year to the 5th of April the following year. So the tax return that's about to be filed, um, that's got to be filed by the end of January, that's the one that covers the tax year that started on the 6th of April 2014 and finished on the 5th of April 2015. You wouldn't report, you wouldn't do a tax return for a tax year that's still going. So it's, it's not for the tax year that we're in at the moment which is 2015-16. So you have to make sure HMRC are expecting a return from you. As I say, if you're a sole trader, you let HMRC know about your business. If you're in partnership, you also have to let HMRC know about your business. That needs to be done by one particular partner who's called the nominated partner. 
All the other partners also have to let HMRC know to expect a return from them, because if you're in partnership, you have to file a tax return for the partnership itself and one for each partner, and the partner's returns will show their share of the profit from the partnership. And if your business is a limited company, then when you registered your limited company, if that was fairly recent, sort of within the last few years, HMRC will actually already know about the company because Companies House will tell them when you set the company up. But what HMRC won't know is to expect an individual tax return from you, director shareholder. So you need to make sure that you notify HMRC of that as well. Okay, um, so getting down into the in, in, into the, the nitty gritty and the yeah. uh, and, and and the beef uh, on the bones. What information do you actually have to include in your self-assessment tax return? Basically, all your income and any costs or expenses that you can take off it to reduce the amount of tax you pay. So, shall I share some examples? Of mm -hmm. that Please do, yes. Yeah. Okay, so it's going to be things like the... Um, let me explain first how a tax return is actually laid out. Um, there's what's called the main return section, which everybody who does a tax return must fill in. And that has common types of income that are common across the board to everybody. Things like bank interest you received on an account, things like dividends you receive on shares, maybe if you've received some pension income, maybe if you've actually contributed into a pension, maybe if you've made donations to charity, that all goes on the main return and then for each other type of income you have you do a separate set of pages in the tax return so they're called supplementary pages and if for example you are an employee and you earn wages you have to do a set of employment pages to report to HMRC how much you've earned and how much your employer deducted in tax from your wages Okay, HMRC would already have that income, but they, um, information rather, but they would have had it from your employer in the context of your employer. They now need to know sort of all the income that you have had as an individual. So that's why you have to put that in again. If you've got two jobs, you do two sets of employment pages. And then from there on, if you are a sole trader, you'll do a set of self-employment pages. If you're in partnership, you'll do a set of partnership pages. If you've got some capital gains, that is if you've sold a large asset, and you've got to fill in capital gains forms. For instance, if you sold um, a, a large old master picture or something like that, and you've got to put that on your return, that's on the capital gains pages. So you have a separate set of supplementary pages for each one, and then you have to file the tax return to HMRC all in one go. So there's some examples mm. as to what you might put on a tax return. As I say, the main return, common types of income like dividends, interests. Uh, by the way, careful with bank interest. A couple of things I just want to say about that. One is if you've got ISAs and you receive interest or dividends on an ISA, leave that off your tax return completely, don't put it on. The reason for that is because an ISA is tax free. Um, everybody, all British residents get a certain amount, a certain allowance each year that they can invest in an ISA. But you have to actually invest that money in an ISA. You can't put a certain amount in an ISA and a certain amount not into an ISA and then say, well, I, I don't want to pay interest on any of that because if I put it all in the ISA, then I wouldn't then I wouldn't have paid tax on any of it. Doesn't work like that. If it's in the ISA, it's if it's tax free. If it's outside the ISA, it's not. That was actually a question I got this morning. Excellent. Yeah. And another couple of points on bank interest. Um, if you've got a joint account, perhaps you've got a joint account with your spouse, um, you put in half share of however much interest you've received on that joint account. And if you're a sole trader with a business bank account, the interest you receive on your business bank account still goes on the main return, not the self-employment pages, because HMRC treat that as income you've received. So it goes on the main return. If your business is a limited company, and it receives interest on its bank account. That interest doesn't belong to you, it belongs to the company. So the company will, put, will report it on its tax return, you don't put it on yours. Okay, um, we're just about to get into uh, some of the, uh, the sort of the main mistakes and uh, uh, pitfalls that people fall into uh, when doing yes. self-assessment. Uh, but before we do that, um, as I said at the beginning, you know, we are very open to questions from you guys. That's yes, kind of why we do these things. So um, if there is something specific as we get into this, if there's a, you know, a particular topic that we're that we're covering, that there's something um, very very uh, distinct that you want to ask us there, then uh, th then please do uh, do write it up. As I said, the uh, the Q and A tab should be um, uh, should be on your screen here. Flick around with the mouse. 
mouse and you find it and that'll open up uh, a box to to uh, the right hand side of the page and you should just be able to write it right there yes, uh, and indeed. if you can't put it onto the event page that you came through originally uh, i've got uh, i've got that open here i can see everything that comes in so uh, we will get to it very very quickly i promise you yes um will. Cool. Uh, so up until that, I think, yeah, as I said, what are the, the main kind of mistakes and the pain points that people find when they're doing self assessment? Uh, <laughs> another 20 minutes. So, <laughs> okay. um, um, I went into some of the um, pain points around bank interest. So mm -hmm. what I might do is sort of just gradually think my way through the rest of the return. Mm -hmm. So thinking about dividend income, if your business is a limited company, then you may well be taking money out of the company as a salary and also as dividends. Um, remember that no matter what your company's accounting year end is, you always include the dividends on your tax return for the tax year, not the company's accounting year. So let's say your company's preparing accounts from the 1st of January to the 31st of December each year you've still got to report what dividends you received or were due to receive between the 6th of April and the 5th of April, not between the 1st of January and the 31st of December. Watch out for that. Um, also, do make sure that you leave out of your tax return any interest on, uh, sorry, any, any interest or dividends on an ISA, as I said before. Mm -hmm. I think that's worth repeating because if you put them on your tax return, you'll get taxed on them. Leave them off your tax return. Moving on to the employment pages, some of the key mistakes people make there are either to, to miss off a job. So, for example, if you've changed jobs partway through the year, um, I was just earlier today doing a tax return for my brother who has changed jobs midway through the tax year. So I had to remember to do two sets of employment pages for him, not just one and also to make sure that I put in the right boxes the salary and tax for each of his jobs and to get them the right way around because otherwise the revenue could have asked him for more tax. Also to make sure that I put in his company car properly because otherwise it would look like he paid a lot more tax than he should have otherwise done and the revenue might have tried to give him, give him some of it back when he's not entitled to it. If you have benefits in kind from your job, if you've got a P60 and a P11D, P11D is where you report um, benefits that you've received from your employer. If you've got a P11D, remember to put that on your tax return as well. Remember as well that the P60, which shows your salary, P60 or P45 if you've left your job, and P11D that you want to pull the information from for this tax return is for 2014 15. Get the right tax year. If you get the wrong tax year, then you'll pay the wrong amount of tax, and HMRC will either get you to pay more tax and potentially charge you interest, or else they'll have to give you back the difference. Um, I mean, I know it sounds great to get money back from the tax man, but it's much better to give them the right amount in the first place. So, on the employment pages, Make sure that you do it correctly if you've changed job in particular. Two sets of employment pages, one for each job, if you've got two jobs or had two jobs during the tax year. Include benefits from your P11D if you had any. And also do, do make sure to um, do, do make sure and get the right boxes on your P60. So don't look for national insurance, for example, on your P60. You don't actually have to report national insurance that's been deducted from your salary on your tax return. The salary deals with all of that separately. So correct tax year as well, really, really important. The reason for that is that the rates and allowances change every year. So what's right in one tax year will be wrong in the next. So that's really important. Okay. Um, so before uh, before we go any further, um, let's say if any of these uh, terms uh, you're unfamiliar with or you don't really know, uh, oh, if yes. you go through to our website and look at our accounting glossary, you'll be able to see uh, information about kind of what they are and stuff. So I know some of the forms that we've yes. mentioned are very very specific, and there's uh, some accounting terms there as well. So very um, good point, Adrian. Yes, because I was throwing around their references to things like P60, P45, mm -hmm. P11D. As Adrian quite rightly says. We've got explanations of all of those in our accounting glossary on the website. If you mm -hmm. Google free agent glossary or go to the link that I'm sure mm -hmm. Adrian and one of his colleague or one of his colleagues will put up. Certainly will. You'll find explanations for what I'm talking about when I say all of that. Yeah, we'll put that onto the uh, onto the event page as well. Um, yeah. We'll link through to that. So uh, yeah, it's great. Um, so so Carry continue. Carrying on with mistakes, Adrian. Mm -hmm. Shall I move on to the self-employment yes, pages please. now? So this is if you are a sole trader. Um, so let's have a think about what you might get wrong if you are a sole trader. The first is when to report any income that your business has earned. Unless you're using the cash basis 
to do your books as a sole trader, you must report income on the basis of when you earned it. Not when you invoiced, not when you were paid, when you earned it. So let's say that as a sole trader, you're doing your books to the 5th of April every year. I'll talk about that in just a moment. Mm -hmm. um, and you did a piece of work in March 2015 that you didn't invoice for till the middle of April and weren't paid for till the end of April. You must still put that into your 2014-15 tax return because you did the work before the end of your accounting year, same as the tax year 5th of April. Now, I mentioned there your accounting year and tax year. Again, we've got definitions for those in the glossary, but just briefly, the accounting year is the date to which you as a business prepare your accounts every year. The tax year is always the 6th of April to the 5th of April. If you're a sole trader, by far the simplest um, dates to pick for your accounting year are to match the tax year. But if for whatever reason you want to use a different set of dates, perfectly fine. Let's say you want to use the calendar year instead. In that case, it's very important to report the right year onto your tax return. So let's say you're doing your 2014-15 tax return, you're self-employed. The figures that you want to include on your tax return for income and expenses are the figures for the calendar year to the 31st of December 2014. Why? Because that's the accounting year that finishes in the tax year, which is covered by this tax return. This tax return covers the 6th of April 2014 to the 5th of April 2014, 2015, beg your pardon. So if you are a sole trader preparing accounts from the 1st of January to the 31st of December each year, you include on your tax return for 2014-15 the accounts for the year to the 31st of December 2014 because you use the accounting year that finishes in the tax year. Watch out for that because it gets confusing. By the way, though, if you use free agent to do your accounts, free agent will actually include the correct dates on your tax return. It will actually include the accounts for the correct dates on your tax return. So that's just one thing to note by there. Mm -hmm. uh, I'd also add as well that, um, yeah, if, if you didn't already know as well, if you're a sole trader or a director of a limited company, you can actually file your self-assessment return through free agent as well. Excellent point. Again, Adrian. we've uh, you know we've got a lot of information uh, over on the website about how yeah. to do that. But uh, yeah, we'll, um, we'll 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 dig out that and we'll uh, we'll link through it as well. So you know, if if, if you are using free agent and you're uh, uh, going through this process at the moment, you may not yes. know, um, and it does help save a lot of time and hassle. It does. Yes, it does. So yes, that's a very good point. Thanks for that, Adrian. And the final thing I'd like to just look at when it comes to self-employment, one of the most common mistakes people make is to include the wrong amount for whatever kind of cost it may be. Mm -hmm. And there's a lot of rules and regulations. Excuse me. Um, we've actually got a whole white paper that's called Can mm -hmm. I Claim It? I think, isn't it, Adrian? That's right, yeah. Yeah. And what that does is it addresses some of the most common expenses that businesses will encounter and some of the most common mistakes they make. Um, so typical ones might be, for example, if you're a sole trader and you buy yourself food and drink when you're out and about on business, HMRC are really, really strict about when you can claim the cost of food and drink because they say everyone's got to eat in order to live. So as a sole trader, the only circumstances where you can claim food and drink when you're traveling on business are if you're already overnight on business, um, if your business journey is outside the normal pattern of your work. So for example, if you live and work in Nottingham and you make a journey to Lincoln to see a new client, then you could claim the cost of any food and drink that you bought on your way to Lincoln. And the third is if your business is by nature itinerant. So that would be if you were, for example, a chimney sweep, you were going from house to house, never spending too long at any one house, you're, um, any one place of work, you're doing your work and you're traveling on to the next place and on to the next place and on to the next place without, as I say, spending too long at any one place of work or visiting the same places of work regularly. In that case, your business is, as I say, by nature itinerant, and you can claim the cost of food and drink when you're traveling. Another area that people do often get confused with is clothing. Again, HMRC are very strict about when you can and when you can't claim the cost of clothing that you wear for your business. Um, because what they say is that everybody has to wear clothes in order to be warmly and decently clad. Um, so clothing is, has what HMRC call an intrinsic dual purpose. That means you cannot get away from the fact that it's to keep you warmly and decently clad, which is not a business purpose, as well as, for example, to make you look smart for work. So, for example, if I, as an accountant, buy myself a new suit 
to get to talk to clients in, then because that suit is also keeping me warmly and decently clad, I can't claim the cost of tax relief on it. There's cases where you can claim the cost of clothing are as follows. Um, firstly, if it's protective clothing. So for example, if you are a, um, a bricklayer, then you could claim the cost of an, um, a high vise jacket and a pair of steel toe cap boots. But what you cannot claim are the cost of, for example, the shirt you wear under your jacket or, or your jeans, any sort of normal clothing that you happen to be wearing with your protective clothing, mm -hmm. you can't claim the cost of that. The second is if you have a uniform. So for example, if you are a self-employed nurse and you wear a nurse's uniform, mm -hmm. the uniform, by the way, has to make you easily identifiable as doing what you do, just for someone taking a look at you. So for example, if someone saw mm -hmm. me wearing a smart suit, they wouldn't know at a glance whether I was an accountant or a solicitor or, or whatever. Mm -hmm. So, um, they, they wouldn't know, they wouldn't know as I say whether I was um, whether I happened to be an accountant or a strippergram just to take a look at me in a suit so um, in that so in that case I'm not easily identifiable um, sorry Adrian were you about to uh, yeah no I was going to ask um, would that also count for uh, branded clothing so say for example like you know um, if uh, I was a self-employed carpenter or a handyman and had a specifically branded like, polo shirt or something very good question. And the answer is that HMRC don't actually give any specific guidance on that. I see. Right. Yeah. So you might be able to get away with claiming that as advertising yeah. for your business. HMRC might well then turn around and say that that's clothing. It has an intrinsic mm -hmm. dual purpose not allowed. Yeah. Um, but until that actually goes through the courts as a case, I don't think there would be explicit guidance mm -hmm. on it, unfortunately. I, so I, it could be argued both ways. I think, uh, uh, yeah. Buy something that's very garishly coloured that you can argue is definitely not for fashion purposes and then be prepared to argue it. Yes, basically it must not be part of an everyday wardrobe. Mm -hmm. um, the third um, example of clothing that can be claimed is if it's a costume, if you're an entertainer and it's your costume. So for example, if, um, if Adrian happened to be moonlighting as a children's magician and he bought himself um, a top hat and a cape to wear as a children's magician, then yes, he could actually claim the cost of his top hat and cape because that's his costume. Excellent. Um, we'll probably look at a couple more of these just in um, uh, a bit more detail as well. I know that there's, uh, there's some specific sort of expense and cost related things that are yes. uh, um, uh, that are very, very fiddly and there's some sort of top oh, line stuff so. um, that we can get into. Um, again, uh, just to say we've got about eight, seven or eight minutes left. So yeah. um, again, Anything you want to ask, just uh, post it up just on the Q&A app, uh, put it up on the um, up, up on the event page, and uh, we will uh, uh, answer it as soon as possible. What um, was that question we had about Oyster cards, Adrian? I think uh, that, that was, was on a face really good one. Well, we'll get to this one first, because I know oh, okay. Trista, who is watching, uh, has just uh, posted and said, I'm a sole trader and have a car on uh, HP. Uh, agreement started during the tax year. How do I include that in my return? Uh, I've seen that to claim per mile is the easiest way, but I haven't recorded any mileage to date. Okay, Trista, if you haven't been keeping mileage records, then what you'd need to do is to make a best estimate of how many miles you've traveled. So for example, if you've got a diary, an appointment diary and you could see who you visited on which day, or if you've got a, a calendar, maybe a Google calendar that's got a, notes of um, who you visited on which days, use that as a guide. Use something like the AA route planner to identify how many miles you traveled that way and work it out that way. That's that's what I would probably do because whether you use the mileage method or the actual cost method, and there is an article on our website that talks about motor expenses for sole traders that outlines what those are. Whether you use the mileage method or the actual cost method, you're going to need to know how far you've traveled on business in terms of miles. So as I say, use other records you may have to piece together as best you can how far you did travel. Yeah, and I know you've, uh, you've, you've posted a, uh, a follow-up saying that you mostly use your car for work, yeah. which is great. But um, as I'm going to probably uh, go into a bit more detail here, um, it's really important to make sure that you differentiate exactly you what do. you've done for business and what you've done for personal, because yes. HMRC is very strict on that. They are very very strict on that Trista Adrian's absolutely right so you need to be super careful about business journeys because what HMRC will look at was what was the main purpose of the journey so for example if you um, if you do the school run for example and you stop on the way back to deliver some business cards to a client who happens to live on the same route then you can't actually claim that as a business journey because it's got a personal purpose your main purpose of the journey was to do the school run um, if you've got a journey that was for mixed purposes 
then if you can separate out the business element from the personal element, for example, if you had to do a half mile detour or a half an hour detour to visit a client on the way back from the school run, you can claim the cost of the detour, you can claim the distance for the detour, but not the whole journey. Um, again, follow up, I think um, she's asking if, uh, you use, uh, if you claim by mileage, does that mean that you can't claim the insurance, the MOT or the repair costs? That is right, because the mileage claim covers the whole cost of buying and running the car. So if you're using the mileage method, you can't claim capital allowances on the car, nor would you claim costs like MOT, servicing, repairs, insurance. The only thing you do claim is things like um, car park tickets that relate to one specific journey. You can still claim those. But any general running costs of the car, they're all covered by the mileage allowance. Cool. Uh, I hope that helps. Uh, you said thank you, by the way. I think we were in the middle of pleasure. actually answering the question. So, yeah, total pleasure. I um, hope that helps. Uh, again, any follow-ups, just, uh, just just post them there and ask. Yeah. Uh, I know we did have uh, this other um, travel-related question, which um, uh, which came through on Facebook uh, a couple of days ago, which says, um, uh, as a photographer in London, I use my Oyster card all the time to travel to jobs. Uh, I have an annual zone one and two travel card uh, to work out what I've spent on travel for work purposes. Is it acceptable to work out the daily rate for the card uh, and simply apply this as a cost to any day that I work and travel by public transport? Or do I have to work out each individual fare cost? What HMRC would say is that you should use any fair and reasonable method to work out how much you've travelled on business. When you've got something like an Oyster card, or you've got something like, that could equally be um, well be applied to something like a phone where you've got three minutes, mm -hmm. and you don't necessarily know which particular minutes you used for each and every call. Um, use a fair and reasonable method to apportion it. I think I think that would work. Um, so the method that was described, um, where you work out on average how much you travel on a business day, um, so long as it averages out over the course of the year, what HMRC might possibly do is ask you for some examples. So they might sort of ask you to show them how it works for a certain day and for a certain other day. If it averages out over the um, course of the year, you're probably absolutely fine. Cool. Um, one of the areas that I was going to, uh, to, to touch upon was um, uh, obviously working from home. Yes. Uh, I know one of the big questions and uh, common questions that we get is, you know, if I'm a sole trader, um, what can I actually claim for, for, for working at home? Are there any costs and expenses that, uh, that, that I can include in my, uh, in my yeah. tax return? Well, again, there are two different ways you can do this. There's a um, If you're a sole trader, you can use um, flat rate allowances, which are called simplified expenses. Um, there's a set of rates that you can use depending on how much you work at home. Or you can, again, use a fair and reasonable method to work out how much of your actual household running costs relate to working at home. And so what you one way of doing that would be to add up the total number of rooms in your house, under recent guidance from HMRC, we would say leave out bathrooms and hallways, but include kitchens in that count up of number of rooms. Work out how many rooms you use for business and how much you use any room for business. And it's really important to not use a room 100% for business and nothing else, because otherwise, if you own your home, when you sell your home, you'd have to pay capital gains tax on the proportion of the sale that relates to that room, because it becomes a business asset if you only use it for business. So you'll be able to claim a proportion of various running costs of your home. Think things like rent, council tax, light and heat. Um, if, and internet charges. Um, yeah, those you'd work out slightly differently depending on how much you use them for, mm -hmm. um, for business and how much for personal. Um, I'd probably say don't use the sort of room size percentage for phone and internet. Mm -hmm. um, use a percentage of how much you actually use the line. Um, things like cleaning or repairs to the house. Uh, you can include a business proportion if the clean or repair includes the room you use for business. If it's just for the room you use for business, then include more of it because it's not for the rest of the house. If it's only for the rest of the house, don't claim any of it. Um, you can't claim water unless it's for a, spe a, a separate metered pipe. So for example, if you use a lot of water um, to work from home, say you've got a dog grooming parlour in your home, mm -hmm. and you have a separate water pipe that's separately charged, then you can claim the cost of that. Otherwise, you can't claim the cost of extra water. 
Um, by the way, one other thing I want to mention is if you're the director of a limited company, there's a lot fewer costs you can claim. You aren't allowed to claim any proportion in a limited company's accounts of costs such as rent or council tax that would be the same whether or not you worked at home. You can only include a proportion of costs that actually vary with how much you work at home, things like your light and heat. And even then, as the director of a limited company, you can only include those if what you do at home is work that actually earns the company money. If what you do at home is sort of admin and what have you that doesn't earn the company money, you will not be able to claim business use of home through your company's accounts. Excellent. Um, yeah, hopefully that's that's helpful because I know it's a uh, it, it's it's, yeah, it's it's a big a fiddly issue that we do get a lot of uh, a lot do. of questions about. Uh, remember, if it, uh, it is a fiddle, remember you have as a sole trader got the option of using the flat rate instead. Just bear in mind though that that might possibly be lower than the proportion of your actual costs. Um, six of one and half a dozen of the other. Do you want to spend the time crunching the numbers or possibly pay more tax and use the simple flat rates? Excellent. I think you know, with, with all these things as well, if you're uh, if, if you're unsure about anything or not really sure what's best for your business, then uh, do go and speak to a, a friendly accountant. Yes, be yes, able to help exactly. You. Because I'm not actually authorised by HMRC to give specific tax advice. Mm -hmm. um, Adrian and I can only provide general guidance. If you are not sure how something relates to a particular situation, you would need to speak with an accountant. Mm -hmm. um, we've got about... Um, oh, uh, we have a question on the events page, says Jess. Uh, excellent. We'll uh, uh, come to that in a minute. We've got about uh five minutes uh five minutes to go i think um so we'll just cover a couple more um i think that's our help of getting a bit excited because that's a question that we've already yes, uh, we responded to but thank you jess yes. um, uh what we'll we'll do is we'll um quickly uh, go on to um what happens if you can't file on time? Because obviously the, the self-assessment deadline is coming up at, uh, on uh, January the 31st. Um, an awful lot of people uh, file theirs in the run-up or yes. on the day. Uh, but there's also, I think, HMRC uh, estimates that there's you know, just under a million people that don't actually manage to meet that deadline. What happens? What would what, what you have to do if you know you're not going to make the deadline or yeah. if it looks like you're not going to? Well, the first thing I'd say is that if you've got a reasonable excuse, quote unquote, for not filing on time, do let HMRC know before the deadline if you possibly can. If, for example, you were affected by the recent floods in December if um, or January, if you are in one of those areas of Cumbria or Yorkshire or Lancashire that were flooded out and that means that either your records were destroyed, your computer was destroyed or worse if, you've, if, you're, if your entire home was underwater, that is a reasonable excuse. HMRC has said that they will accept that as a reasonable excuse. They have got a helpline you can ring in those situations. If we could share the link to that helpline. Uh, that yes, awesome. definitely. I think we've actually got, um, I, I think we've got a, uh, an article on our website or certainly there's, uh, the, the, yes. there are others out there which uh, which go into detail about the um, the reasonable excuses that you have. And yes. uh, I know that the, uh, the, the HMRC yeah, helpline's that on one that. Of them. So for example, if um, other, other examples of reasonable excuses might be there was a serious illness in the family, there was a death in the family, um, your records were destroyed in a fire, something like that. HMRC will accept a reasonable excuse and they are actually quite nice about it. Mm. Um, I had one client some years ago who suffered life-threatening head injuries in an accident. Um, they charged him a fine for filing his tax return late. We wrote in and explained and they said, oh yes, no problem, don't pay the fine. So they're not unreasonable. But if you don't have a reasonable excuse, then the first thing HMRC will do if you've missed the deadline, I'm afraid, is to fine you £100 for missing the deadline. Um, and that is, um, that is charged no matter if you've paid all your tax or if you don't have any tax due. If you don't file your return on time, you get charged the £100 rate filing penalty. Yeah, and that's uh, regardless of how late, whether it's a, yeah. a minute or a day or a week I'm or afraid whatever. so. Yes, Adrian's right. And also, if you leave it more than 30 days after the deadline, the, the fines for late filing start mm -hmm. ramping up. So what I would suggest is if you do miss the deadline, Try and get your return in as soon as you can to avoid any more penalties stacking up. Mm -hmm. And also, because if you do file after the deadline, HMRC have actually got longer to open any inquiry into your tax return. Mm -hmm. So it is always a good idea to file as soon as you can. Good. Yeah. And, I, and I guess the very final point to make is that you know once you've uh, filed, whether that's late or early, you also have to 
pay your tax. Exactly, well, yes. Filing your tax return and paying any tax and national insurance due are actually two different processes. Mm -hmm. um, you can file your tax return through free agent, as we mentioned earlier, or through other software, through HMRC's own, on, on, own online portal. But you do still have to pay your tax. Mm -hmm. Filing your tax return and paying your tax are two very different things. Mm -hmm. Make sure that you pay your tax and remember to do that on time. Because this year the um, payment deadline falls on a Sunday, you'd be as well to treat the deadline as if it was the Friday. So as if it was this Friday coming, Friday the 29th. So make your payment, whether that's by faster payment over the internet or use your credit card over the phone. There are various ways you can pay. If you want to send the revenue a check, send it today because it's got to get there and it's got to clear into their accounts. So if you haven't sent them a check, send it today. Um, but as I say, if you can pay online, pay by credit card, make sure you get your tax paid. Excellent. And uh, remember as well that uh, you also get fined for not paying your tax. Oh, and right. those fines can continue as well. So if you're not filed and you're not paid, then that can stop yeah, going up. It'll, up, up it up, will up. stack up. Uh, excellent. Um, well, I think that's uh, probably it uh, for today. I think, um, yeah, uh, again, very, very final point is, uh, as, as we've said, if you know um, any of this stuff you're still uh, a little bit concerned about or you don't really know or you still have some questions, then it is really advisable to go and see your accountant. Uh, that might be tricky if you don't have one at the moment because obviously there's not one until the deadline, but um, not impossible. But if you do, uh, and you do have an accountant you work with, then do go and speak to them. They are very, very uh, you know, expert at this time of year. This is what they do. So um, you know, go and, uh, and, and and go and chat, get the advice that you need, and uh, then tackle your tax return after that. And if there's anything that you're not sure about on the tax side for the HMRC, then do also give them a call. Be prepared that it might take you a while to get through because this is the busiest time of it year is. for them. But you know, as em as Emily says, they're not unreasonable people. No, they're not. Um, th you know, th they're not a shadowy figure that you can't approach, and they generally do tend to be relatively reasonable. If they you do, have yes, reasonable they do them. because a, a lot of people sort of see HMRC as almost a demon king figure. Sort of, oh, mm. they're really nasty. You've got to keep away from them at all costs. Honestly, if you try and work with HMRC, they're actually really quite nice folks. I've, um, I've been doing that for the last 15 years, working alongside them. Mm -hmm. So do do talk to them because, as, as Adrian says, they're not unreasonable. They, they will listen. If you've got a genuine reason for filing late, they mm -hmm. will be sympathetic. Yeah. And if, you know, if you're in general, you know, genuine difficulties you don't understand as well, then they will. They will do their, best, be, to do their best to help. I think it's when you uh, when you get to the point where you're trying to actively hide something from them. Exactly. They tend to that's get, when they that's don't when like they get it. The yes. Good stuff. Okay, well that uh, that is it. I really hope that that um, that's been useful for uh, for all of you that have come. Thank you very much for your questions. Um, if there's anything more that you'd like to uh, ask us, then um, you know just write them up on the uh, up on the event wall, and um, we'll get to them as, as, as soon as we can. It might be a bit. Uh, take a little bit of time, but uh, you know, if it's something that you come back and you go, "Oh, I really wish I'd asked that," then then do it, and we'll we'll, yeah. we'll we'll try and address that as best as we can. Um, if you're not already using FreeAgent, do go across and, uh, and and have a look. As I said earlier, uh, www.freeagent.com. Um, it's uh, online accounting for uh, micro businesses and freelancers and contractors. Uh, perfect for this time of year. Um, uh, even if you've already got your self assessment out of the way, if you're still um, looking at uh, having a better way of doing it for next year and for staying on top of all of your finances and uh, invoicing and uh, your time tracking and uh, project management, all that kind of stuff, it's uh, you know all all, all in one place uh, super easy to use and uh, I think you'll like it so, uh, so so do go and have a look at that um, uh, over on our website and on the blog there's tons of information that you'll find about um, all kinds of topics that we've been talking about such as expenses and invoices and tax and VAT and uh, you know a whole host of stuff that you uh, that, that you need to know if you're running a small business about the financial side. So do go over to that. Um, you'll see it. There's a blog uh, button on the top of our website, and you'll get straight to there. Um, and uh, yeah, that's it. Uh, hopefully, uh, we'll be doing another one of these before too long. So do keep a look out on our social media pages. Um, uh, you've already found us on Google Plus. Uh, we're free agent here. Uh, we are free agent app. 
which is on Facebook. Um, so go and like our page there. We're at Free Agent on Twitter. That's the main one that we use for uh, getting in touch with uh, small business, uh, small business clients and our customers there. Um, and we'll also be posting this straight onto YouTube as well. So if you didn't catch the start of it and you want to see any more, then find it there. Uh, I think we're Free Agent Accounting, but you'll 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 find us on YouTube uh, because there'll be tons of videos that show our lovely faces uh, <laughs> over on our page. Um, so yeah, uh, thank you very much for coming. Until next time, see you. Thank you very much. Bye.